here in Hollywood, California. You're about to see Coach Candy, but before we get started, please silence your cell phones. Do not talk or text during the show. Emergency exits are the doors to your left. And now Couch Candy with your host, Jen Candy. such as The Heat, and you can catch him on Veep and CBS's Life in Pieces, the very talented Dan Backerdahl. Oh my gosh, I think I forgot my battery pack for my apnea machine. Oh, oh, no, oh no! I know, what am I gonna do? Just get, Just get in the sleeping bag, man. That's all you gotta do. Don't worry about it. So glad you guys are my brothers. In law. Wait a minute. Oh. Oh. Spider eggs. Spider eggs. It's no, okay. It's styrofoam. They I know, fresh I know. I got a dress shirt. Fresh from the... Mm. <laughs> I ask all my... Okay, so I ask all my guests what their favorite candy is. Do you remember what your response was? Yes, I do. What was it? It was that. That? What is that? Butterfinger. Butterfinger. Uh, just like Bart Simpson. I love it. Why do you love it? I, you know, I think it's because as a kid... This is really going to be fun. Peanut butter gave me heartburn really bad. <laughs> yeah, as an adult, too, actually. Oh, uh, yeah. But I'm an adult now, so <laughs> you can I can eat some Rolaids. <laughs> but uh, as a kid, it gave me heartburn, so I couldn't have PB&J, which was kind of a heartbreaker. Oh, that's horrible. And so this was a safe uh, peanut butter for me. And... It's the candy bar that keeps on giving. It is. Because it gets stuck in your teeth. Yeah. And you're eating it, you're eating it for you hours save after. It, save it for later. Yeah, save it. Oh, I'll save that for after the show. <laughs> Dan and I, do you remember, we met at Second yep, City. Of I was working in the box office. You were on the main stage. Um, is acting something you always wanted to do? All right, so yes and no. Okay. I, 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 first, I thought I wanted to be an astronaut. Really? No joke. I lived in Florida. I grew up in Florida. Okay. So you could see... Uh, before the space shuttle, you could see rockets take off, and it was very easy to go, it's right here. It'd be like kids that grow up here going, I'm going to be a movie star. And it'd be like, oh, God. <laughs> um, so I thought I wanted to be an astronaut, and then my dad, who was great at uh, smashing dreams, said, you better get your act together, kid, because you got to have these grades, and you better go to the Air Force Academy. And then I went, oh, fuck it, I'll find something else to do. <laughs> and um, then uh, we got a big VHS... Uh, camcorder okay. that had a, a giant VCR that you carried with it. So the tape didn't go in the camera, it was in the VCR that carried with it. And the battery pack was the size of a, a shoebox. Oh, so you carried around 30 pounds of equipment and my two older brothers made a twilight zone called the toilet zone. <laughs> where a boy went in to pee in the middle of the night and there were the toilet people who came up from the, they came up from the sewer. <laughs> Because something bad was happening in the sewer. Something worse than the sewer was happening in the sewer. <laughs> and, uh, anyway, and they didn't let me play. Oh, did you and have I a was, big family? Yeah, okay. so six brothers and sisters. So I had two brothers and four sisters. Oh, wow. And, um, they and we all them. still talk. Oh, that's good. Mm -hmm. That's Pretty good. good. A good job by the folks. I know, they did very well. They did very friends. well. So they did not let me partake. I watched. They used my Klingon doll, my, uh, my Star Trek Klingon doll. Oh. Uh, but that was the only... Um, uh, participation I had. So when they were done with that, I went and made my own Laugh-In. Laugh-In kind of did like a re-up in the, in the mid-70s, I want to say like 77, 78, something like that. Okay. Laugh-In came back, and so I stole an episode of Laugh-In and just did it. So like I, I wrote the original material, which was basically me stealing Doctor It Hurts When I Do This, and then I'd go to the other side of the table and put on a coat and go, then don't do it. And, 
uh, so I did my whole, I did a, a newscast, I did the whole thing. I wanted to be on Saturday Night Live. That's what I wanted to do. That was your dream. Right. And my brother's next project was to do Saturday Night Live at home. And I pitched a giant fit. And they said, you've never seen the show, but I knew that all the older kids stayed up to watch it. I knew who Mr. Bill was, all that stuff. And I said, you have to let me be in it. And they said, fine. You can be John Belushi as the Samurai Delicatessen. <laughs> so we stole the script from Samurai Delicatessen and reenacted it in our living room. And, uh, and I went, we sat around and watched it every week. The family would sit around and watch it. And I went, what could be better than this? They're paying attention to you vicariously right. by watching the TV. Yeah. So I've forced strangers to vicariously pay attention to me <laughs> for a living. <laughs> So you were yeah, naturally I, born an actor and you didn't I, even know it. I guess. I tried other things, but I couldn't do them. I tried things that required study, and, and, and I just couldn't do it. You went to, if I'm correct, it was the Repertory Theater of America, which is yeah. Shakespeare. No, no, no. Not it's Shakespeare? A, it's, a, yeah, it's just a rep theater that tours the country. Remember the vans that the touring company had in yes. Second City? The, it's a, like what you call like a 12-passenger van or something. We took the back half of that van and put a wall up and then carried sets, lights, <laughs> and all that stuff, and toured the entire country. I went everywhere from Miami to Seattle, up to Maine, and down to San Diego, and all points in between, touring for 10 months oh, wow. with a repertory theater company doing um, Woody Allen, oh, a, so a Renee that. Taylor, Joseph Bologna play, <laughs> and, um, and a Neil Simon play. Which, you know, when you're 21, right out of, college, you're, you're primed to do midlife crisis. <laughs> and here's the thing. We came through Chicago. I saw a show. Um, it was uh, November of, uh, it was Thanksgiving of 1994. Okay. And I saw the main stage show. I didn't think it was any good. Mm -hmm. And I saw all the pictures on the wall on the way in and I went, huh, I can do that. This isn't very good. I could do that. And these people came from here. I'm going to come here and do this and be them. Because they wound up where I wanted to be. So I'm going to do that. And then I found out just how hard it was to get that job. But I moved to Chicago. Right. After, so you went from Florida. Yeah. From toured touring all around. The country, yeah. And then landed in Chicago. Landed in Chicago. And then I came. And the first show I saw when I got in town was um, Paradigm Lost. Okay. So that's... Rachel Dratch, Rachel Dratch, yeah. Tina Fey, Scott Adsit. Uh, right there was enough. My mind was blown. But Jenna Jolovitz, amazing. Uh, I believe Scott Holman was in that show. Anyway, and I went, oh, no. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> like, it was supposed to be, you know what I mean? If you can understand what it's like to go, this is just shitty enough that I could get in. And then all of a sudden the bar so then all of a sudden really go, raised. I can't get in here. <laughs> it's as good as those people on the wall now. Son of a. Uh, um, Mr. Window, how did you get to Second City then? Well, then I, then I did theater in Chicago. I just started auditioning for everything in the back of the Performing and the, and the Chicago Reader, which were kind of the, the arts papers. Right. For those that didn't know what they were doing, the newspapers. Um, yeah, not, yeah, not newspapers. On, Sorry, for piece stuff. of paper, piece paper. had ink, ink on, on it, got on your hands. Anyway, and uh, and I auditioned for every play that was coming down the pike, and um, and I did everything I could get my hands on until I finally said, "Well, I should get paid." So now I'm going to do only things that pay. I didn't, you know, there's no rhyme or reason to it. I just thought I should set goals, well, that's and good. then once I hit that goal, I'll change the goal. Okay. So uh, the goal always was work at Second City on the main stage. Right. That will get you on Saturday Night Live, and then you're done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not wrong. I'm not entirely wrong. No. I mean, look at it. There's no a lot of you people. Know. That's their that's their angle. But and Second City was a feeder school for course. everyone on SNL. Right. And um, you know, I, I, and then I found out how hard that was, and how you had to actually mm -hmm. show up to those auditions. I was going to say what made it hard. Uh, well, you know, just, you? Getting, just getting into Second City turned out to be really, really hard. I, I, what was your audition? I asked questions. I went to shows. Rachel Mason was a friend of mine. She lived in the same building that I lived in. Okay. And she was doing shows at what was called the Improv Olympic at the time. is now called I.O. Uh, sister, well, mother to I.O. West. Yep. And um, she was doing shows there. And I went and saw shows. And I knew another guy there that I did a play with. And pretty soon I started hanging out there. And I said, I'm going to take classes here. So I took classes at Players Workshop in Second City, okay. 
and then I quit just before they started writing scenes because I was scared to write. So I said, well, if I quit, I can't fail. <laughs> See? Yeah. This is the secret to success. <laughs> quit. quit while you're ahead. You cannot fail if you quit. You quit. You didn't fail. Right. <laughs> On my terms. That's your poster in, the, That's in your office my, right there with the kitchen. It's me hanging, hanging, in it's there. Me hanging on the branch. I'm going to quit. Um, As you're letting in go. In fact, I just quit a fantasy football league today over being mad at someone. Rip. Will not lose this year. <laughs> you are definitely... Found a way to show them. Okay. Yeah. A glass right off. half full. Yeah, glass, glass ceiling half ceiling. full. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So, uh, uh, so you and, quit and then, uh, yeah. before you went to write. Yeah, and then I did the same thing at the Second City. I started taking the Second City classes. We started writing material, and I went, oh, I can't do this. Yeah. <laughs> I, got, I didn't learn how to do this at the other place. i got to get out of here, so I quit. And then I started taking classes at I.O., and then when I got to I.O., I started performing with a guy named Miles Straw, who was, uh, you know, there's T.J. Jagodowski, who a lot of people would agree is the funniest improviser in the world. Uh, uh, and Very I'm talented. saying that. Yeah. Because I agree with that, but I always thought Miles Straw was the most talented improviser in the world because he had a mind that would say, yeah, we could sit here and say some funny stuff, but it wouldn't it be more interesting to do what Del Close wanted to do, which is break your mind in the process and make you think and make you learn, and, and that's yeah. what Miles tried to do. And so I worked with Miles. How long did you work with Miles? For Mark? two and a half years, Miles and I did a two-man show, oh, wow. which started with an audience of about three people. The show was called Zumpf. And it started with an audience of three people, and I don't think they all stayed. And <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, and then it got to the point where it was standing room only, and Great. we owned, we created Wednesday nights, which is the night that TJ and Dave right. uh, wound up doing once Miles moved to Los Angeles. Anyway, and um, I did that show with Miles for two years and started climbing. Second City came calling. I auditioned for the Second City Touring Company and uh, was told, sorry, it's not going to happen. And then uh, Greg Mills, who's a good friend of mine, was on the touring company, got a job for a commercial. And they said, pick, stay in the touring company or go do this commercial. And he went, I'm going to do the commercial. Right. And they went, great, can you go on the road this weekend? So I went on the road to oh. replace a friend, which was a hard thing to do, right. uh, after being told I don't have the job. So I went on the road for 10 days, and as only Second City can do, I came home from that trip to find the letter that said, we're sorry, but you're not hired to the, <laughs> to the touring I company. Just, I, then, I have those letters, too. Yeah, I have those letters. That's, two oh, days nice later, try, but no. Yeah, two days later, Kevin Dorf corners me upstairs at, at I.O. and said, guess what? what? You got hired to the touring company. I said, but I got a letter that says I didn't. And he goes, <laughs> I framed it and everything. He, he said, keep that letter. And I said, oh, I kept it. Uh, I don't know where my diploma is from college, but I know <laughs> but where that letter is. But you know where letter that letter is. is. Yeah. Again, quit. Quit so while you're, fail. yeah, so you don't fail. Um, it's going to be a theme. How long were you on the road with uh, the touring company? I toured two years. We did a USO tour. We went to Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, oh, wow. Dubai, Bahrain, pre-9-11. So that was really great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hate to say it. It was. It was, it was really great. Slightly. We were like, we <laughs> kind of walked around going like, you're welcome. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. We'll do this show. This will be hilarious. You guys are going to love this. We got to get that call, uh, call to prayer alarm clock. Peter Gross oh, yeah. was like, we got to get these. He bought one for Seth Meyers and a bunch, bunch of people got these call to prayer alarm clocks. We thought it was hilarious. And then we got home in, uh, uh, I think we went in August or something. We got home. And then, of course, 9-11 happened. You go like, oh, shit. And I quit soon after because traveling became. I was going to say, what was traveling yeah, like? Yeah, traveling became such a bitch. You could no longer carry a uh, pot on the plane. <laughs> when you're touring, it's a very, it's more important than whether or not they're going to pay you well, or feed you. <laughs> is whether or not you could smoke a joint after well, the show. Well, if you're driving across the country, that's a little bit easier to yeah, transport. If you're, driving, if you're yeah. flying. They're... And when you're flying to Denver and then after that flying to Seattle and then down to San Diego before coming back it becomes near impossible to carry that much pot without drawing attention. <laughs> so truthfully, I quit because I went, Ugh, I'm, I'm becoming a pain in the ass for these people, <laughs> and I'm not happy, so I'm going to quit. Um, so you quit? Yeah, so I quit. And guess what happened? What happened? Then I got the main stage. Did, how'd you get See? the main stage? See, quit before you fail. <laughs> get a promotion Don't for quitting. Don't listen to people that say, just keep going. No, Quitters never. that cat, you know what happened to that cat? He died, died. in that tree. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> he hung on to that tree. Hang in there. It's almost right. He hung on to that yeah. tree. His skeleton's still hanging still in that tree. <laughs> it's a black light. You turn off the lights and it's just yep. a skeleton. <laughs> so you, okay, so then how did you get the main stage? Uh, well, I didn't, I didn't quit like, you fucking assholes, I'm out of here. No, that's right later. Quit like, uh, yeah, that's later. <laughs> I quit by saying, I think I'm done. And they went, yeah, that's, a, yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> and then I understudied oh, no. the main stage and I apparently did a good job. Uh, uh, to where, I mean, that, that's the, the recurring theme, I think, is that I always said, like, I might not always be the easiest person to have around, but I'll do my job. Right, and you you'll know, do it I, if we, well. Yeah, if we have a put-in rehearsal, which is when they teach you how to do the show, I will have studied that tape, and I will know every nuance right down to when Ed Furman scratches his eyebrow. Right. I'll have it down. And I was understudying TJ on the ETC and, and Ed Furman on the main stage, and apparently it went well enough that they were like, well, this is really great. Uh, didn't get the job yet, but continued okay. to understudy well. And Joyce Sloan went to bat for me and said, if you don't put that guy on the stage, you're out of your mind. Um, and I guess they, you know, they, they were, it was in the works. Yeah. You know, it was on its way. And then it was just about time. I mean, as we know, I mean, unless you're Chris Farley or Mike Myers or Eddie Murphy at SNL, it's not likely that you're going to get that job before it's really your time. Yeah, I'm a firm They're, believer of you yeah. are in the, the right time at the right place and, and just it's a it's a timing issue. Sure. And, I, it, you know, I never thought I'm going to go up there and change. The, they're going to go, holy crap, good thing we got him on this stage because I'd never written anything. <laughs> Shh. And so I got there to start writing uh, Doors Open on the Right, and I didn't know how to write anything. So I just show up with, I got an idea. It's a massage parlor. <laughs> okay, that's not enough. And it's the women getting massaged, and you can see that the rest of the cast members are going, where's the rest where's of this, this idea? Yeah. And I'm going, and the men are doing the massages, and each time they do like something to them, uh, they blurt out a secret. And they went, hey, that's a pretty good idea. I went, yeah, well, came up with that one yesterday. <laughs> like, holy crap, I'm good. I got one, I'm good. You're dying, you're yeah. dying. Well, my dad was horrible at writing uh, sketches for SCTV or anything. I think yeah. he was notorious for always having paper napkins with ideas. And he was the same. It was like, well, uh, there's a bar and there's a guy who plays Mambo and that's it. Let's go from there. Made sense to me last night. Last night after uh, that drink, it sounded, yeah. seemed like a good idea at the time. Yeah, exactly. Now go write that and make it work. Yeah, but I was fortunate there were people, Liz Kukowski, I mean, there's a whole bunch of people, but Liz was the one that, that to me, I went, what the hell? She just like, every day she comes in with the opening number and the closing number. And then she comes in with the best group scene. You know, it was really kind of amazing to watch someone who goes on to be a writer. Right. You know, because she did. She ended up uh, writing for. Did she write for? She S wrote for S SNL, SNL for a while, and now she's uh, she's in the Neighbors movie. She was in Neighbors and right. Neighbors Two. She's a great actress, um, and thankfully she's finally getting attention for that as well. So you would, she's also an executive producer on Last Man on Earth, which is a which is a, great an amazing show. show. Love that show. So you were on main stage for a, ten months. Ten, <laughs> ten months. Not even a full and year. Then, That's, anybody want to guess? What do you do? I quit. I quit. I, quit. <laughs> I, quit. That's right. I was there when you we quit. Were getting, yeah, we were getting ready to write a new show. And um, the Second City had just started a new deal with Sony Pictures Television, where Sony Pictures Television could go back into the archives of Second City and look at any scene that had ever been written from, you know, from Severn Darden on up to Liz Kikowski. Right. And they could take that scene, and if they turned it into a TV show, they would give a bunch of money to Second City. And Second City would take some of that money and give it to the people that wrote it. Yep. And then those people, all six of them in the cast, would share it. So even if Liz came in with a piece of paper and said, here's the script written, she's going to have to split that little bit of money that Second City was going to give with all six of us. And I said, oh, hell no. no. And truthfully, what really happened was our, our uh, equity rep was there that day, and we were talking about any problems that we have. And, <laughs> and our stage manager, God bless him, who's been there forever, said, yeah, I got a question. Uh, do we get paid for back vacation time? <laughs> now, this guy had just had his 25th anniversary that year because he got the job the same time that Pope John Paul became the Pope. And so I knew how long he'd been there. Dedication. Yeah, and, they, and she said, well, yes, of course you should. How long has it been? And he said... 18 years <laughs> and I just went whoa they're not gonna tell him hey we owe you back money for 18 years oh. they're never gonna care about you 
paranoid actor who's afraid to try to write. So get out of here now. And so I said, I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this Sony addendum to the contract. And they said, you'd sign that or you don't work. Oh. And so I said, all right, well, I'll sign it. And then it started to eat at me. It was the beating of that hideous heart, yeah. you know, below the floorboards where it just, every time Heck I went girls. in there, I went, you fuckers, yep. you're, uh, you're going to get me. You're going to get me. Why are you trying to get me? And it all came to a head one night. I punched a wall and broke my hand. And uh, Jeff Garlin was sitting backstage, and I came backstage. Look at it. Look at what they did. Look at what they did. And he went, what the hell's the matter with you? And I said, they, these guys, they don't care about us. And he said, then quit. Then quit. What do you care? Quit. Yeah. You did the job. Nobody cares how many you did. You did it. You got the credit. Get the hell out of here. Quit. And I went, yeah, you're right. I'm going to quit. He quit? Yeah, he quit. So Let's I, I learned. Waited. There's, I took there two. seems to be a theme. Jeff Garland, Dan Back at all. Two men who would tell you quit to get to the top. Everybody else would tell you don't quit to try to get anywhere. Um, so I took two weeks of uh, mental health leave. Um, and I came back with a clear head and quit. And yeah, well, that's what you, I, I remember that. And I don't think I had seen you that night. I saw you the next day because when I was working in the box office, you, yeah. you would come in with the wrapped hand. Oh, yeah, wrapped I had to hand show and... everybody what they did. Oh, yeah, look at, look at this, look at this. Look at what they did. That, I said that exact thing, look at what they did. Look, look at what they did. And my castmates looked at me like, oh, my God. Oh, I knew he was nuts, but this is this insanity. This is insane. <laughs> Needless to say, I had a bit of a drinking problem at the time. Sometimes that happens at Second City. <laughs> everyone yeah, has, there's a history. Everyone has, well, there's a lot of people at Second City, their paycheck didn't make it home. It was paid to the bar. Mine was one of those that I always went like, what's this down here? This line is negative. And they went, that's your bar tab. And yeah. I said, oh, we don't get free drinks? And they said, no, you've never gotten free drinks. You've been here for three years. You've been on the stage for a year. You've never gotten free drinks. And I went, what the hell? I've been getting charged this whole time. I went home, looked at my checks. I've been getting charged the whole time. The whole time? And was paying so little attention to oh my life. Oh, my that, gosh. Uh, anyway. But shortly after... I quit drinking. You quit then drinking? Then guess what happened? That's a good thing. That, no. It's like when... My friend Chuck says, yeah, it's like winning a medal at the Special Olympics. <laughs> oh! You're so you. good! Oh, good for you! Oh, aren't you cute with your not drinking? <laughs> Chuck said it, not me. I just refused. You just, you just smile uh, and nod. Just mm -hmm. But then shortly after, you landed a yeah, correspondent role on The Daily Show. Six months later, I got The Daily six Show job. Yeah, so the, the, quitting is a really good trend cool. for you. The Daily Show, SNL, and Mad TV all came to town in the same week. Okay. I did my Mad TV audition. They asked you to do three characters and three impressions. I got three impressions out in my first character, and she went, thank you. And I went, no, 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 I worked really hard on this. I'm going to finish. Um, so I did not get that job. <laughs> um, then SNL came and did a, a showcase at I.O., and I did the monologues, and I cried while talking about my cat. Uh, I did not get that job. <laughs> and then the next morning, I went in and did the Daily Show audition, which was three stand-up pieces that you do in front of the blue screen. Yeah. And uh, I had rehearsed them, and I had a character, and I had a little flair here and there, things I thought would work, and I got that job, almost on the spot, basically. Wow. Now you can yeah, Now you can clap for that. that one. That's actually a good thing. So that, the, the, did you have to write your own material for that? No. no. Or was that No, all? thank God, no, no. <laughs> I was just no. curious because. No, it was not a requirement. I think at that point, uh, Stephen Colbert wrote his own stuff. But no other correspondents were writing. I know their own I stuff. had to audition for the Daily Show way like much later, but they required you to yeah. write your audition and then perform your right. audition. Right, well, that was the John Oliver effect. Yes. Once John got there okay. and they went, why the hell are we hiring around. all these people that we have to have writers write for? Why not have them write their own stuff and the writers can write for John? And then that's what started happening. They hired more and more people. Wyatt Senek. Um, Oh, God. Jordan Klepper. Okay. Uh, on and on and on. Kristen uh, Shaw. All these people that were brilliant writers on their own. Uh, John Hodgman, uh, Dimitri Martin, all these people that were coming in as, as contributing correspondents and so forth. They were brilliant writers, and so they were writing for themselves, and they went, oh, good. That frees up the writers to write for John. And um, that was not my model. And, but your strength uh, was your improvisation. 
Right, I thought. Um, <laughs> or not. Not there. Not there? Uh, not what they were looking for. Oh. I always like to say. What were they looking they, for then? They came in and asked me to play a tuba. I played the tuba well, and they went, wow, you're a really good tuba player. I said, thank you. And then they handed me a reed instrument and said, now go play that. And I went, I don't, <laughs> I don't know how to play this. Uh, and it did not go well. Uh, day two, Stephen Colbert uh, walked into my office because it used to be his office, and he said, hey, new guy. And I said, yeah, Second City, we got, you know, I just talked to Joyce today. And he goes, oh, God, I love Joyce. Hey, listen, bit of unsolicited advice. And I said, yes, please. And he said, don't let the iconoclasm stop just because you're here now. Okay? And I said, got it. Now, I had to look it up. I was just going to say. Um, <laughs> And I what want to I seem read, smart, but... Yeah, 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 exactly. And, and I always like it's like, it's what a great joke. that. And then I looked up Iconoclasm, it's the truth. Uh, and, uh, and what I read was, hey, you're a trailblazer. Don't stop being a trailblazer just because you're here now. And it was pointed out to me later, it could have had another meaning, which is, that's Jon Stewart. Don't let him stop being Jon Stewart just because you work here now. Okay. And so I walked out in the hallway and I went, hey, coach. And he went, what the fuck? Who's that guy? And that was it. Uh, so, so it was two years of being very uncomfortable for having been far too familiar, far too early. Got uh, it. You got to remember, I was like, I can't believe it. I got my life back and I'm well, so happy it's again. Well, people and, who are Second City and that whole, it, yeah. it's a sense well, of family and you just, oh, everyone hangs out and this is how you should work. We're team people. Right. We're team people. Yeah. And that's, Steven was a team person and that's what he said to me. And I thought, well, that's what he's talking about. We're team. Right. We're team people. And he was saying, no, 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 yeah. this isn't that. This is a one man show. Let him be, you play with us down here and let him be up there. And I missed the point entirely. And as a result, <laughs> I, you know, I made him very uncomfortable, I think. I think I made oh. John very uncomfortable. And as a result, I wound up harboring resentment that was all my own making, as they usually are. Um, where I thought, wow, this guy, what a dick. And it's like, no, nah, he was just uncomfortable with how you tried to act like you're his friend. And he doesn't know who the hell you are. <laughs> who's, yeah. who's that guy over there? Yeah. What was the most uh, uncomfortable situation you had to be in as a correspondent? Uh, well, there's so many, it's so hard. <laughs> oh. um, uh, interviewing uh, Senator Chuck Schumer was really difficult because he was like, no, no I'm not answering that. Because he's media trained, right. and he's used to dealing with actual journalists right. who know how to ask a question in a way that they can get their answer. And he's dealing with an improviser who's like, "What's your favorite color, Chuck?" No, nah, I'm not answering that question. It's, <laughs> it's not, not relevant to the topic. And I go, "How oh, the hell does he know that? Like, I just want—I need him to say blue, right? You know? And he won't do it. He won't do it, no matter what. I, I want to trick him into saying something. Not going to happen. So that was uncomfortable." Uh, one of my very favorite pieces was one where uh, there was a female prison in Shakopee, Minnesota that didn't have a fence around it. Hi maximum security, but no fence. So I don't know how maximum security is. <laughs> and we interviewed this really nice old Minnesotan that lived across the street. <laughs> and his wife made uh, lemonade and cookies for us. And then he told me he'd rearrange my asshole for me if I, if I embarrassed him. <laughs> And I'm sitting like this with him. This is how those interviews are done. <laughs> You're like this far, and then the camera's like that. So your knees are touching. And he's going, I rearranged more than one guy's asshole for him who double-crossed me. I'll tell you. And I was like, holy shit, holy shit. And all I have with me is a field producer who's basically a film student who's now a producer and a writer. Brilliant guys, but, like, they're not going to fight. <laughs> you know, they're, they're not the going to get my back. You know? Oh God. God. <laughs> So that, that was, you know. Terrifying. There was many uncomfortable moments. It, you know, there's plenty of them with John where I would say something. Bruce Springsteen came to the show one night as an audience member, and afterwards John came backstage and said, wow, it doesn't get any better than that for a kid from Jersey. And I went, man, I don't give a fuck. Where are you from? That's the boss. And he went, <laughs> and walked away. And I thought, oh, what's the matter with this guy? <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying this really, not really hard. It doesn't know how to be a frat boy. I don't get it. <laughs> what was the transition like then? So you were on The Daily Show for three? Two years. Two years. Almost to the date. Almost. I moved to New York on September 11th, 2005. Oh, wow. Okay. And I left on September 20th, 2007. Oh, wow. Okay. And then you were there. And then you started doing more film and television. and. Yeah. Well, we de I decided uh, uh, we better get the hell out of New York because we're going to go broke and we can't work here because I don't know what I'm talking about. But that's what I thought. So let's get out of here. 
So uh, my wife and I packed up and uh, put all our stuff in an RV and drove cross country and visited Graceland and the Grand Canyon. Oh. And because um, I figured that's a good that's way. That's what to you're supposed to do. Easy Everyone in. does. And then San Bernardino, and then um, and then moved here. And I, I got a little work right away, yeah. but then things dried up really bad, and I didn't work for a year and a half. And I was, I heard a guy talk about going to Home Depot and and sitting out front because oh, he said, yeah. I'm a I'm a regular like English speaking like American you know dude. Handy jobs. I'm sure I can get those jobs stuff. first, right? Yeah. And I was like. That's a brilliant idea. I'll go sit out there and go like, hey, wait, wait, wait. I, I can you lift. You need a translator with me. I can lift and I can hammer and all that. Like I was really ready to do that. And I was going to take the uh, fireman's course because I thought anyone could be a fireman, you right? You couldn't be. You didn't. <laughs> so astronaut to fireman. So you've, you've really touched yeah. everything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and then something happened. I... Um, you were in the heat with Melissa McCarthy and Sandra Bullock. Right, yeah. Well, first, Larry Charles, uh, who was a producer on uh, Mad About You and Curb, uh, Your, Curb, Curb Your, Your Enthusiasm, and Seinfeld hired me for a pilot that nobody ever saw. But he just instilled me with so much confidence. But it was that kind of confidence where it was like, what do you need? You know what you're doing. Go do it. Yeah. And it wasn't like, I don't know, what are you doing? He filled me with so much confidence that I kind of charged. He's a very calming presence for, sure a, was, for yeah. a gentleman. I worked at Sundance and I picked him up from the airport because I was working at Sundance, got lost. He was very calm as I'm driving going, I'm yeah. so sorry, I'm not getting you to your hotel yet. Oh my God. And he was like, it's okay, just relax. We'll figure it out. We'll, yeah. we'll get there eventually. I'm and like, he's a character. He's a he's gigantic such a, character. Such a character and gigantic. And yeah, and I just kind of thought. Beard and, and he's wonderful. Was, I respect his work so much that I thought, if this guy believes in me, then I can yeah. believe in me again. Yes. Because I had, it was and over. I, I was done believing in me because I had gone as far as I could go in Chicago and I thought failed. Because right. I had kind of come about after quitting drinking, I looked at it and I went, oh, you failed. You quit. You gave up. You failed. Now you go to The Daily Show, and you don't have what they need. You failed. Right. Now, working with Larry it kind of instilled this new confidence in me where I'd go into auditions and go, hey, man, Larry Charles believes in me. I didn't say that, but I thought, Larry believes in me. But if, if you, you don't have believe that, in me, he's your Jiminy Cricket, yeah, isn't exactly. he? Yeah, I was like, I was like, man, I'm wishing upon a star. I don't need you. You need me. But I'm, that's not what I'm telling you or showing you. That's what I'm thinking and feeling again all of a sudden. The confidence that I got from working with someone like Miles was restored. Right. And along comes Paul Feig, and I worked on The Heat with Paul, and he did the same thing. He just basically was like, I love what you do on Veep. Um, just do that, except right. now you're an albino. And I said, <laughs> so I got a chip on my shoulder. You know, so instead of being a bald guy, I'm an albino guy, and I got a chip on my shoulder about it, and she keeps pushing the button. He said, you can do anything you want. Don't make fun of her weight. And I said, I'm, I don't have any intention to. And he said, good. It's the only rule we have. And I said, okay. And I did whatever I wanted, said whatever I wanted, really? and he roared with laughter and encouraged it the whole way, that's and great. it was a fantastic experience. Oh, that's and fantastic. they were you know, she's amazing to she's watch been, So it's great that you were able to have the freedom to improvise. And yeah. How long were you in makeup for? Uh, you know, uh, every, every time I put it on, it was all day. Because it took so long to put it on. Oh, okay. It took two and a half hours to do the makeup. And, and then, then retouch it all the time. If you put the contacts in, you can see in this picture here that the contacts all around my eyes, they did pink eyeliner on on my eyes on oh, the eyelids on the eyelid on, on the, the eyelid there. on the inside the part that men would never know anything about <laughs> most men and then the eye uh the uh <laughs> mascara was white and so if you put the contacts in my eyes would water so you had to put the contacts in first then do that eye makeup oh. so now you're stuck with those contacts in all day so i was in makeup all day now the 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 uh pupils yeah. were opaque so i sat in my trailer like this <laughs> listening to Netflix and, oh, and, no. and I would be like hey can you is this is this that rush documentary yes okay <laughs> click. thank you and then I'd sit there listening to Netflix <laughs> and every now and then I'd go sit out on my stoop of my trailer because I knew anybody that rode a bike by was going to go what the you know because it was fantastic makeup 
Uh, but it was all day, every day that I was on set, and I was there for two months, and I was on set for fourteen or fifteen days. Oh my gosh, that's a long. Those are yeah. those are long days. But it was days. Boston, right? So you what what? Who's gonna better, complain? Boston in the summertime, it was amazing. Oh, that's so nice. So and then, okay, not and then, but Veep. So you were already on Veep. I already did my one, my first episode. Your first of Veep. episode, yeah. the pilot. Yeah. How did you land that role? Uh, Armando Inucci, the uh, creator, well, one of the co-creators of the show, did a film called In the Loop a few years earlier, and I auditioned for and booked a part on that okay. at the exact same time that I booked a part on Observe and Report. Nobody. Um, I saw it. Yeah, you saw it, but <laughs> still, we're not going to clap, <laughs> because even if we saw it, no, 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 no. This is that thing again where it's all good for you. Um, no, I, I'm fond of it. But anyway, and the agent said, what? You're going to do the Seth Rogen movie at Warner Brothers. You're not doing this unknown movie with these unknown people and James Gandolfini and Sigourney Weaver. You're not doing that. You're doing, and I said, no, but this is the one I trained for. This is the one that's improvised. It's, there's a script, but it's improvised. You don't understand. This is what I did in Chicago. The whole reason I went there was yeah. to learn how to do this. What are you doing? And they said, you can make this decision later in your career. Now we're making it. you got to do this. So I did Observe and Report. And when they told Armando, he sent me an email and said, don't worry. We'll work together someday. And when Veep came along, I auditioned. And um, the casting director had me come in and read for the part that, uh, that uh, Tony Hale got, okay. uh, Gary. And I said, I think I'm supposed to be reading for this other part. And she said, uh, let me do my job. And I said, I, I, I would never in a million years Tell think of telling you how to do your job. He cast me in that other part in the movie, and I didn't get to do it. He, that's the part that he... And, Can I just have a shot? Can I just yeah. try? So I, and, and she went, Dan, you're going to be fine. I said, oh, I'm not worried about I got Larry Charles on my shoulders. <laughs> and she knew. And I went in and I auditioned, and uh, Armando went, why are you reading this part? You should be reading this other one. And I went, that would be great. <laughs> like, and she said, if, I'm so sorry. And I said, please, I don't, you know, I'm not trying to piss anyone off here. So they had me come back in and I read for the part that Matt Walsh does, uh, uh, Mike McClintock. And uh, Matt and I tested against each other in the okay. test. But it became very clear very quickly, it's Matt. Right. He's perfect for this. Right, he And is. at the end of the testing process, uh, Armando came in and said, you all did such a wonderful job. It's such a difficult make our decisions so difficult you're all going to get calls in three minutes that's how difficult this is to make this decision <laughs> we already know our answer, we already know yes, our answer. but that's fine i mean they have to say that and he said uh, don't worry we'll find a place for you and i went okay and then i knew they were shooting the pilot and then i knew they were shooting episode two three four five six seven and i went i guess it's not going to happen and then i got a call in uh november of that year 2012 it doesn't matter right yeah. And they said, uh, you're going to Baltimore, you're doing an episode of Veep. And I said, oh, you made good on this promise. And I got the script. And if you've seen the first season, the last episode, it's all me. Right. And as I'm reading this script, I'm like on the plane on the way there, trying not to cry. <laughs> I, have a, I have a clip Legitimately. Of, your, yeah. of your character that I just think is the one of the funniest characters oh, please. on there. And just so offensive and... Fabulous at the same time. Let's oh, this whole being pleasant is fucking exhausting. Yes, sir. It's very tiring. I'm running out of nice juice to spray at these shit munchers. Hi there. Good to see you. Holy Christ. Look at the size of this one. Buddy, I think you're as big as my gay dwarf. I need to see the vice president now. Oh, sorry, I don't work here. You know, I do work in the West. Well, then get the, the hell out of my way, you leaning tower of... Uh... Pizza. No. Shit. Good. Move it. Yes, sir. <laughs> All due respect to Nelson Franklin, the, <laughs> the greatest straight man, yes. and what a and, and a, f a fantastic guy. Um, What's the process like on Veep? With oh, like it is the if you're an actor, it's a dream process, particularly if you've had any improv experience. Right. You, like I said, you get your script, you know, a day before you get on a plane. You're flying. Out. We shot the first four seasons in Baltimore. Flying out there put you up in a really nice hotel. The next morning you get up, you go to a, a table read. There's Julia, there's Tony, there's Matt. The whole crowd is there. All the writers, everyone's sitting around. Do the table read, good laughs. And then they say, all right, let's get up. Uh, Dan, Julia, Matt, we're going to do scene six. Why don't you guys get on your feet? You take your scripts. You read through it a couple times. And then they say, all right, well, trash that. You know what you're supposed to do. Just play. And then you improvise. Wow. 
and then they'll throw a couple alternate lines at you or pull you aside and go, what if you really want to pick something up in her office or something? So they, you know, kind of like, you know, uh, uh, stoke the flames a little bit and keep it moving. And then they move on to the next scene and then you break for lunch or go home. And the next day you come in and something you improvised is in this script. Wow. And you go, what? You made it. I didn't get You're writing writer. credit for You're this. A- and I finally <laughs> wrote something. Um, no, but it's funny. I never, this, I just said that out loud and realized, no, I oh, I never, I never cared if we got writing no, credit or I, not. No, you wouldn't. But, but I just- it's true. I did finally write something. You when did. I finally acknowledged that Brian Stack and Kevin Dorf and all these other guys were right when they said, you are a writer. Improvising is writing. Yes. It's, it's the just, hardest kind of writing. You're your writing brain. on your feet in front of strangers. Mm-hmm. Shit, writing at your desk is easy then. You know, I still don't do it. <laughs> I, I, have a, I have a hard crazy. time with writing, too. It's just I've got the ideas, but when it comes down to on that lovely pad of paper or well, anything, it's just... Anything else sounds like a good idea at the yes. time. Like, oh, laundry. I need to clean that litter box. Yeah. You know, oh, it's I like, think the dog needs to go on a walk yeah, again. Like, you would think I would love it, but the friends that I have that do it for a living go, oh, it's terrible. Yeah. It's terrible. I have to do it an hour a day without it, without hesitation i must do it an hour a day but it's terrible and but they do it was there anyone specific that you were channeling with this character or uh my brother tom and he takes great offense (laughs) but it's true when i said that the first time i said that in an interview somewhere he called me he said what the fuck are you doing to me you tell people i fucking talk like that guy what you you fucking asshole and i went think what are you you talking about he's a prosecuting attorney (laughs) you know he's practically a politician he's very acerbic Um, uh, but he's also probably the funniest guy I know. Uh, and he's a performer. He's a, he's a trial attorney. He's a trial lawyer. He has to stand up there and convince the audience that he's telling the truth. Wow. You know, it's just that his is a competition and ours is not. Right. Well, that's great. They try to make it a competition, but it's not. Well, and Veep is still good. So it's on its third season. Fifth Fifth season season now. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Sorry. Yeah. We just shot, uh, well, it's, it's airing now, but we shot. The fifth season got shot out here. That's right. Which was nice really, to be really nice. Because po- you were close to home. To go home. Because I would work on Veep, with the exception of that first season, that first episode. Uh, I would work, you know, two, three hours, and then go back to my hotel for four days. And then you're in a hotel in Baltimore in wintertime <laughs> for four days. You can only go to the Poe House so many times. Right. Edgar Allan Poe House. Yep. So many times. It's nice to have you know, kind of a sense so of the po normalcy. House. The Jesus po- <laughs> I'm at the Poe House. It's okay. Good God. You did Veep, and you also had another great show on um, FX. Was legit. Yeah. Let me say, if you have not, thank you. I you love not, legit. If you've not watched Legit, it's on Netflix. We were on FX. Uh, they killed it. Whatever. That. that that's just a stamp of approval. Right. It means it's awesome if yeah. they cancel it. If they can't look, it was great it was the most early. rewarding thing I've ever done. And why is that? Because it's a comedy that I had to cry in, and I had to actually care about other characters. I had to act in a comedy, without just being. I mean, like Roger Furlong is a lot of fun to do, but he can be somewhat one-dimensional right. in that it's like I can pretty much do anything I want as long as I end it with fuck you and walk out, it's all clear, right? right? Whereas with Steve on Legit, um, there were consequences. If I got a black eye in one episode, that black eye is going to be there the next episode. Right. Uh, You know, we get in a fight in one episode, uh, we're still not talking to each other an episode later. Um, Norman Lear is a big fan of Legit. Really? Called Jim and said, I love that show. Oh, well, they canceled it, Norman. Of course they did. A short so. short clip from uh, legit oh, too. Oh please! It's uh, that's okay. Blackout. Come on, Billy! You can do it, mate. We believe in you, Billy. You can do it, mate. Oh it, man, it's gonna get you. Now, Jim Jeffries is the star of the show, the creator of the show. It's based on his real life experiences. He's the Australian guy. His good friend uh, back in Australia. Yep. His younger brother had uh, advanced stages uh, um, muscular dystrophy. Dystrophy, yes. And um, was in a wheelchair and one day said to his friend, please bring Jim over, I want to talk to him. And he said, you got to come to the hospital with me. My brother wants to see you. And he goes, I can't go to the hospital. It's too depressing, man. I can't do it. And he goes, that's why you have to go. You're the only, you know, anyway. So Jim goes and the brother says, 
I'm 35 years old. I've never been with a girl. You're the only guy I know that'll do this for me. Please take me to a prostitute. And, um, <laughs> and in Australia, totally legal. And he goes, fucking when? And he says, he says, now, today. And he goes, let's go. And he and the two brothers get in the van and go to the prostitute. And the pilot episode, that's how the show starts. So us teasing the kid in the wheelchair is... Um, it's out of love. Is, is absolutely out of love. And I will say this, the biggest fans of that show, people, people who with suffer with muscular dystrophy. Really? Because not only were they represented in the show for the first time, that wasn't like, oh, my, oh, they, oh. No, it's a strong it was, character. It was a kid who's doing coke off a of hooker's <laughs> boobs. It was a kid who passes out in his wheelchair and falls yep. out and shits himself <laughs> like any other dude does when he's had too much, right? <laughs> you know? Um, so they felt like they were being represented as people who were part of the game right. rather than people who were being pitied. And as a result, that's another reason why it was such a rewarding experience to get emails, to get letters, to get to, uh, to Twitter uh, interaction with these guys who were like, thank you so much. If I didn't have legit to look forward to every week, I don't know how I'd make it through the week. And you go, did you guys see this? And it's like everyone on set felt good oh, about that. Oh, that's see that, and that's nice that they had that kind yeah. of, no, I wasn't going to say idol or anything, but it's just that kind no, of they, something that they, they could felt watch represented they felt finally yeah. in a way that they felt was what they wanted. Right. You know, they wanted a buddy that said, taking you to the baseball game. It's real. And it's everyday go, life. Yeah. It's not candy coated. Exactly. And that's and they, why I like they the say, show. They say, I hate baseball. I don't want to go. I know, but I get good seats when you're with me. So you're coming with me. You know? <laughs> done and done. And, and one of the guys said, oh, my God. I'd be slapping my knee if I could. That actually happened to me. My buddy took me to a concert just so he could get good seats. And the dude appreciated it. Yeah. You know? Uh, well, congratulations on your second season of Life in Pieces. Thank you very much. Which is yeah. on CBS. I don't know if any of you have checked that show out. That's I love that show. show. I do, too. I am very, uh, very proud of Life in Pieces. Very, I still have to pinch myself because I look at it and I go, how did I get in the middle of this pack? Well, yeah, look, you're kind of with some heavy hitters there. Kind of. Kind of? Yeah. I don't know. Uh, James uh, Brolin. And Diane Weist. Diane one of the Weist. Greatest actors of all time. Um, an incredible person, what a talent, and then Jim Brolin, who plays her husband, who yeah. is the quintessential old-school Hollywood playboy who's now married to the $500 million woman, Barbara Streisand, Streisand. and is just like, you know, back when I was your age, we, uh, we'd play a round of golf during lunch, and they'd wait, and you're like, <laughs> and you're like, what the hell, Jim, and he goes, don't try that, and you're like, yeah, no, of course not. We did a talk back for SAG where they, they bring in a bunch of actors and you talk to them and they said, what's one piece of advice you'd give? And it's, oh, don't, never give up. and Quit your way to the top and all this, right? And Jim goes, Jim goes, don't audition for anything. <laughs> and you go, that's the advice you give actors, Jim. Right. There's only yeah, one actor in the world who can take that advice and it's you. you right? Like, do they love, um, do they improvise with you or with the script yes. or is that... Yeah, we get to improvise a lot. Some more than others. Not, not that some are given more license to improvise than others. Some are more comfortable than others. I was just gonna say so more some do it more frequently okay. than others. I am one of those. Definitely the one that. Those that do. Um, but they, you know, right off the bat, they were like, "And anything you think of." And I was like, "Oh, great. We got to keep it clean. It's going to be on, you know, network prime time prime network. Time. So can't go that route. We're not right. going to have the kid in the wheelchair pulling a flat." Uh, pulling right. a <laughs> But, and I'm not going to be talking about spray, squirting, you know, nice juice at these shit munchers or any of that <laughs> stuff. But uh, we get to play an awful lot. And I'm really, really lucky that Betsy Brandt, who was uh, Marie on Breaking, Breaking Bad. Breaking Bad, who she's uh, phenomenal. Maybe the greatest television show of all time. Yeah. Um, she plays my wife, and we just hit it, it off like immediately. Looks like you guys have so much fun We on do. That she set. is incredible. And um, she and I had a conversation. It's one of those things that I learned at Second City but never learned how to do which is be a good cast member, be a good ensemble member. Right. And I don't say that in a self-effacing way as much as I've learned. And I, so I called her when we got the first season pickup, and I said, I want you to do me a favor. We might be doing this together for a very long time. I want us to still be friends at the end of every season and at the end of every day. That's good advice. So please, I know me, and I know that I can say and do things that people can find offensive or get pissed off at. Please don't keep it a secret. 
please tell me immediately, you just stepped on my toe, and I will make it right. And uh, she took me up on it. Um, <laughs> And, 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 you know, not frequently or anything, but when I did it, she would. And I would go, all right, already. You know, I get it. And then I go, hey, be quick to see where she's right, make it right, and boom, right back in it. And we just get along great. And it's made all the difference in the world. Oh, my gosh. Well, congratulations. And hopefully Thank you. it goes on for, for a couple more. Um, I've got a little segment that I like to do. It's called the Candy Connection. And oh, I was good. trying can I to some think. Candy you can eat some candy. Um, Anybody it's... else want a Butterfinger? Does any, anyone want Butterfinger? You're open wrappers in a theater? That was a test. You failed. <laughs> Connection. Sorry, Jen, this in... isn't your sole Butterfinger. No, I think I've got okay, like, good. no, this is it. This is all I have. This is her year. year whatever, lot whatever you don't give away, okay. you take home. Um, candy Connection, what connection you have to my dad. I know. Okay, I'm sorry. Oh, that's it. No, oh, I did it all. No, I, <laughs> I said uh, Candy Connection, uh, the connection that you have to my dad. So you were, you're in Life of Pieces with Colin Hanks. Colin Hanks was in Orange County with Catherine O'Hara, and then Catherine O'Hara was in Home Alone with my dad. Of course. Yeah. And Besides, I've got an even quicker oh, one. Oh, what's an e even quicker one? I did a bunch of Second City Bizco shows with Martin Short. Oh, there you go. Done and done. We were on stage. And now we've done this show together. And we've done this show together, so and you're closer even, to your dad than, than Martin than my, Short yeah, was. Yeah, so, so boom. And, and I was an immense fan. You know, which I think counts for something. It does count for something. What was your favorite film? <sighs> well, Summer spot. Vacation or is hard to beat. That is hard to beat. Um, for when I grew up, I grew up in the 80s, and that, you know, I mean, that was great outdoors. That was on Pretty yesterday. Fantastic. Well, Get yourself a spin cycle. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a hell of a film, you guys. Um, when I was prepping for your show yesterday, my husband was watching Great Outdoors in oh, the other really? room, and I come out with my computer and my headphones. I was like, is it over? He's like, yeah, it's over. But I think performance-wise, and, and this, when I taught classes, when I taught improv, I used your dad and Bill Murray as examples. Oh, really? Of what, okay, this will probably make me cry. Okay, don't cry. Of what, that's okay. Eat candy. Of what, ca of what candy, <laughs> of what candy is for, of what <laughs> comedy is supposed to be, the way I understand it, and it's supposed to be planes, trains, and automobiles. Perfect. It's supposed to be, it's supposed to be you make me laugh until I have to go pee. But at the same time, I care about Del Griffith. Yeah. I care so that when you hurt him, I'm mad at you. And that's the desired effect. You want me mad at him because I care about Del, yeah. right? And so I use that example, and I also use you know many of Bill yeah. Murray's uh, appearances. But That's that, perfect. to me, those were the two that I always use as an example. I said, you're supposed to be an actor. That was what they taught me in my very first improv class. They said, don't worry about funny. This isn't about funny. This is about believable. I want to believe that you are experiencing what you're experiencing up there on that stage. If I think it's funny, I will laugh. Right. If I don't, I won't. That doesn't mean I didn't like it. Right. And that's what Dell said, yep. and that's what Martin DeMott said. And that's what uh, Josephine Forsberg said. Yep. And these are all people that were doing this a lot longer than most of us Almost, have been yeah. alive. And I just said, if you say so, I mean, you guys are here in the Temple of Satire. Right. And you're saying, you know, uh, 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 Martin Amat was saying that at Second City. And I said, if you say so, I'm never going to worry about funny. I'm just going to worry about being, being believable. And that's key. Yeah. And that's great advice. And on that note, we are out of time. Aww. Aww. Dan, thank you so much thank for you. doing this. I just, I, since seeing you at Second City way back in the day and then till now, and I love watching your career and, thank you, and having that connection and knowing you, and I just admire your it's work. It's my and, distinct honor. Oh, thank you. And thank you guys so very thank much for so coming much out me. to another Couch Candy. <laughs> this is going to be a little bit of a break until the fall, so have a good night, and I'll see you in the fall. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, it was great. That was fun.